reptiles as well. Now, some of the most venomous reptiles do live in Australia, so they have to be very careful, but they know how to deal with them. And I have got in my pocket our stunt bearded dragon basking on a rock. Bondi flies down, grabs it with the back of the head, and hits it as hard as she possibly can. She's got it by the back of the head because this thing has teeth. She is not going to let go of it and she's just going to keep on hitting it over and over again. Even when she has decided, yes, that faded dragon is definitely no longer twitching, uh, she's going to continue to hit it even more because she needs to tenderize it, making it nice and easy to then, hit, uh, to then eat. Are you ready? One more time then, hit it. Ready? Oh, he dropped it. That's it, he's gonna run away. Well done, good girl, fantastic. Well, it is just plastic, by the way, it's not a real big dragon. I should say that to the But, there is another kind of food that could be very to eat, and it comes from us human beings, because, first of all, we're very good at throwing away a lot of rubbish, and they are opportunistic feeders. If they see something that they think will be edible, um, they are going to eat it. But, they have also learned that in Australia, they are fond of a barbecue. And you know what? The sun is shining today, isn't it? Perfect weather for a British barbecue. So long as it's not raining, that's all we need. So I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to send you two over. There we go. <laughs> not quite. Come on over here. Because I think that we should have a mid-show snack. What do you think? Right, so we're going to have hot dogs today. If anybody's peckish, they go. But be careful, because you can have a hot dog or a barbecue in Australia. Be careful, because you never know. There might be a kookaburra lurking nearby who spies that sausage um, and they will snatch it straight out of the tongs. And if they're feeling really brave, they might even toss it straight off of the grill itself and risk burning their own feet. But watch, uh, watch Bruce, are you ready? He's going to hit that as well. He's going to hit it on the floor. Just like Bondi did with the lizard. Good boy. Uh, he needs to tenderize it to make it easier to eat. Hello, Sheila. How are you? You calm down for the picnic as well, have you? But there we go, fantastic. Right, Bondi, would you like that bit? There we go. And all you three need to do is take yourself off that way. There they go. She here on Google Bar, a big round of applause. We've done very well. Let's take this girl off. Okay. I'm going to quickly move the barbecue. And um, just so you know, I have not got Dolly's prop as well out here, which I will need at some point. Um, but what we're going to do. When they have taken themselves away, we're going to head on over to America to have a look at quite a small bird, a um, member of the owl family. In fact, this is the only member of the owl family that lives underground. And she lives underground because she's absolutely tiny. If you have a look over there, we have our own little burrow. Keep your eyes on that burrow because a little face will appear any moment. <laughs> and it's the lovely little face of Etty. How are you? Etty? Well done. So Etty here is a burrowing owl. Again, she lives underground, and I'm sure you can see why. She's smack size. If she's not careful, despite being a prince to herself, she will be predated upon, and she will end up with somebody's tea. Good girl. So, not only does she live underground, she's also going to spend a uh, large portion of time down on the ground. They tend to run around a bit more than they do fly around, because down here, if they were to feel threatened, that's cheating. If they were to feel threatened, they can quickly nip back to their burrows to safety. That's it, let's keep going. Well done, good girl. Fantastic. But she's perfectly adapted for life on the ground. As she walks around, you know, she's got very long legs, very big feet, perfect for scurrying around down here on the floor. While she's down here, she's also going to be always on the look for food. So bugs, insects, and um, they're going to make up the last their dinners. Even scorpions have been known to put this out. That's also cheesy. Let's see. I think I'll go and do slow food today, am I? Let's see, come back here. Well done. Um, they've been known to count on scorpions, quickly bite the stinger off before the scorpion can possibly get there. Well done. Fantastic. There we go, you can have a few bits of that one. But whilst they're out hunting, um, they tend to stay around in little groups of about eight birds or so all together, not really for social reasons, they don't really actually like each other company, they mostly do it for safety. So within the group, you will find the bulk of them 
foraging for food. Some of them may go back to their tunnels if they've got any chicks down there need, uh, in their burrows. But Etty here has got the most important job of all, and that is acting as a sentinel. So she's perched up here, eyes on the sky, looking out for any big scary hawks in the sky. And if she were to spot one, she would scream and shout, warn everybody, danger's about, quick, go back to your nearest tunnel as fast as you can. Don't just stand at the door, you're going to get eaten. There we go, that was sexy. That was burrowing out. Okay, um, right, what we're going to do now is we are going to go to Africa. Um, I'm hoping somebody's going to, thank you very much. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't got my prop. So here comes Sam with a dead cow. Or what's left of it. Thank you very much. Well done, because what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at a very smart bird now. Um, now, when it comes to the animal world, we often think of primates being really intelligent animals, and they are extremely smart. However, members of the corvid family have been proven to actually be much smarter than many primates are. Um, and this here is Dolly. Dolly is our hide crow. Hello, there you go, talk those two little bits. Um, so, she is... I know she looks like a bit of a glorified magpie, doesn't she? But I promise you, she isn't. She is a pied crow. Um, and, hello, you are all over me today, aren't you? Right, can you please go over there for a second? Thank you very much. Um, I mentioned about how she's really smart. Because, if you imagine out in Africa, there's going to be animals that could be killed by a pride of lions. When they've got their food, lots of animals are going to come in to try to have their share of that kill. No, we don't want to the tree, that's fine. Um, now, Dolly here, she would also like to take advantage of this kill. However, she wants to be careful. She doesn't want to end up as dinner herself. So what she'll tend to do, hang around, wait on the sidelines, waiting for those larger predators to come on through, or those larger scavenging animals. So your hyenas, oh my, um, your lions, vultures. Vultures are going to be everywhere all over it. Um, and vultures in particular are normally there just to pick a fight with each other. So. Once all the big boisterous animals have gone, most of the food would have then been eaten. So this is where Dolly's intelligence comes to play because now there's only those last few little bits left inside the skull that other animals cannot get a hold of. So crows have been known to use tools and this is where their intelligence really comes to shine. So Dolly here's got a favourite tool. It is in the form of this stick this precise stick. She takes her stick, she takes it over to the skull, she shoves it inside any little cavity that she can and then she wiggles it around in there. Good. She digs it around in there and then she pulls it out if it doesn't get stuck. <laughs> she pulls it out because hopefully she'll then have some food on the end of the stick. There's also going to be lots of bugs in there as well, also trying to take, oh god, how have you put that in there? <laughs> oh, you got it, well done. There we go. Better wiggle it around in there again. What have you done? <laughs> you it, right. Try the eye socket. Look, come on. Do you want to try the eye? No, she's determined. She's going to keep going for the nose. There you go. Go on, wiggle it around. Well done. And again. Good. Well done. And then you got it stuck again. Oh, Dolly. Go on, bring it with you. Thank you. I'll do your swap. You have that. I'll have a swap. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I know. I've got your stick. I'll keep it nice and safe for you. Um, but yes. Uh, so if they're lucky as well, they might even get some of those bugs that will also be trying to see on those last few bits within the skull as well. Um, now not only do they have a favourite tool, they also have their favourite place to store said tool as well. They do also have their own version of the toolbox, which tends to be our pockets. But now I've been safely stored away, Dolly's going to take us all back. I'm going to give a big round of applause. She's got to the on. Which means we are now moving on the last part of our show and our shows for today as well and um, because we have moved on to the finale and we're trying to use this part of our demonstration now to try to showcase some of the most endangered birds that we have here and fly here at which name so for those of you who've seen our shows before uh, you might have seen us trying this in the past we've only just really started to try to get it a little bit more together so what we're going to do is start off with a little bird who goes by the name of Panini. And he's over there, 
Now, I said this yesterday, every time I say, his name is Panini, I hear a bit of an echo out there of Panini. Yes, he truly is called Panini. Very good reason for that though, and that is because he is a Vizayan terrific hornbill, and his scientific name is Penelopede Panini Panini. That's why it's called Panini. But um, this species is one of the most endangered species of in the world. There are only 1,200 breeding Vizayans left in the wild. Um, and you'll typically see this bird, or you should typically see this bird, hopping around the lower canopies of the rainforest, looking for all those types of fruit that they like to eat, but also bumping insects as well. And Hornbill's got a very good beak to eye coordination, which means he's very good at catching food, just about on the wing as well. They can catch food out of the air. That part is a learning process, as I'm sure you can tell. We only introduced that to him two days ago, so we've got by. Where did you go? We'll see if you want to come back out again. And <coughs> um, so yes, that's the new part. But again, they are an endangered species. See you. Oh, you're there. Hello. Do you want to come back again? Come on over here. And we'll see if we can get you over on the other side. Do you want to come out? Can you? Oh, I've dropped your board thing. So you look confused now. I was like, I've really done that part. Come on, can you? Let's see if he wants to come out and come back out again. Um, Panini here is only 10 months old and this is his, oh bye, this is his first year of doing <laughs> shows. Um, and we started to bring him out in some of our demonstrations towards the end of last year. But this year is by far the first time he has come out here and seen such a huge crowd. Right, I have no idea if he has gone, he might come back out again, but whilst we are waiting, we'll have a look at this little guy. His name is Aku. Our Congo African grey parrot. Um, another endangered species, a bird that you should see flying around in the wild, flying about in flocks with hundreds of individuals all flying around together. Um, but the reason why they are so endangered is because they are the most heavily tracked parrot in the world. And um, in a short 10 year period, from the mid 90s, 560,000 African grey parrots were captured out of the wild to then go into the field of the trees. Of all those birds that were captured, only 35% actually made it to market. The rest of them sadly died through stress and being transported. So, for this reason, we do generally try to uh, encourage people to come into Paris as pets. But, uh, working with those guys that only a couple of the projects that Seven Self is involved in, uh, Seven Self and Zoological Society of London, we are involved in over 50 conservation projects that happen across the entire planet. Um, from the two species of that you just can see flying around, to us introducing Simpson Oryx back into the wild as well. These projects are the real reasons why we as we exist. We could not continue these projects without your help and support. So a massive thank you very much to you guys for coming here today. So by coming here to our news, you have actively helped and supported our projects. But another project that we do also help with and that is with the World Parrot Trust all the way down in South America. We are working to help protect some of the most brightly coloured and beautiful birds. And they are our macaws.
Yeah, let's go. Up! 